everybody at Chess Friends. I'm glad to introduce to you my course that has been designed to touch on all important areas of the chess game. We will be talking about how to calculate variations in chess, one of the main uh, subjects in contemporary chess, because the game evolves and becomes more and more computationally intensive. Then we will speak about how to attack and on the other side how to defend in chess. There are different methods of defense that are important to know and to understand what method applies to which situation. Besides, we will go over some general ending ideas and discuss typical mistakes at this stage of the game. I will show you some interesting examples from my own games to explain what mistakes are and how they could have been avoided. Additionally, we will speak about different strategic aspects of chess. We will cover different pawn structures, such as isolated pawns, hanging pawns, as well as pawn formations with double pawns. Pawn sacrifice is another important element of chess strategy. Uh, I will show you some interesting examples of the pawn sacrifice for the initiative. Uh, we will take a look at some elements of peace play. You have to know where to place your pieces to get maximum benefits from them. The goal of this course uh, is not to provide you with a comprehensive opening repertoire, but we will cover one system for the white side. Uh, it's the Sicilian with C3. It's a positional system for the white side that avoids long theoretical discussion, but allows you to get interesting positions. Last but not least, I will reveal to you my insight on the chess intuition. We will speak about creativity and improvisation in chess, how it is important to think outside the box and look for non-standard decisions. In this part of the course, I'm going to discuss the fundamental ways and approaches to calculating variations in chess. In fact, the ability to calculate variations precisely is at the heart of chess game. You can be an endgame expert, you can know the chess theory well, you can understand some strategic aspects of the game, but all of that will bring you no dividends unless you can compute variations precisely and avoid blunders. Specifically in this part of the course, I'm going to discuss with you the concept of candidate moves, what they are and how to find them based on the key features of the positions, what are forcing lines that you have to take into consideration when you make a list of candidate moves for yourself or anticipate plans and ideas of your opponents as well as the concept of prophylactic thinking, which implies the habit to ask yourself the following question. What is my opinion going to do? What is his threat if he is on the move? Hello, everyone. Today I would like to speak to you about my method for calculating variations in chess. Specifically, what I'm going to do today is to structure for you the process of decision making and explain step by step how do I choose the best continuation in a certain position, based on such key points as candidate moves, prophylactic thinking, and key features of the position. Okay, let's get started, and as a first example, please take a look at the position that you can see on the diagram. In this position, white to move, imagine it just happened in your game, and your goal to find the best continuation here for white. Well, first thing that I would do is to make a list of candidate moves. And in my opinion, it is very important to take into consideration more than one option and to, to do it in a certain order. And specifically, I always start my calculation with forcing lines. Saying forcing lines, I mean checks, captures and moves with a threat. And exactly in this order, checks, captures and moves with a threat. All these moves limit potential responses of my opponent, that is why I believe it's so important to start your consideration with forcing lines. And uh, I would like to emphasize it, uh, if uh, you have some problems with recognition tactical patterns during your games, considering forcing lines, considering all possible forcing lines uh, can really help you to recognize tactical motives uh, for yourself, and for your opponent and uh, to reduce the amount of blunders. Okay, so let's do it now. Let's apply the concept on practice. So we start with checks. In fact, as you can see, white has only two checks here. One of them is knight d5, but it is just suicidal move. Black can just take the knight 
and uh, there is no real compensation, black has to be winning. Another check, bishop g5, seems to be better relative to knight d5, but if black plays simple move king d7, the king attacks the knight, and you can see that the knight does not have a good square to retreat, and so we can conclude that uh, bishop g5 was a meaningless move, black just winning after this move. Okay, checks do not work here. But what about other moves with a threat? In fact, it is very important before you think about your own plans, about your own threats, it's uh, to anticipate the potential responses of your opponent, uh, to anticipate his threats and his plans. And uh, as you can see, uh, in these particular positions, two white pawns are hanging, the pawn on c2 and another one on g2. Therefore, before white starts his own attack, uh, he should take care of these two pawns. Okay, because black's intents are pretty obvious in this position, to take either on c2 or on g2, we don't have a lot of candidate moves, and basically we can limit our list to only two continuations. Short castle, white protects the pawn on g2 and ignores the pawn on c2, and bishop takes on d4. So white eliminates the knight, that attacks the pawn on c2, and black has to retake the bishop. Black cannot play. Queen takes on g2 in view of bishop f3. White attacks uh, the queen and uh, just keeps extra piece. White is winning. Okay. We have two candidate moves. Short castle and bishop takes the knight. Now we have to make a choice. What to consider first? Bishop takes the knight or short castle. And in fact, it is very important to start your calculation with the most principal continuations. Why? Because if you figure out that one of them is winning, you just don't need to spend your time calculating alternatives. You save time and you can invest your time, you can invest this save time into your future calculation. So, so called time management, which is also very important for chess. Okay, how do we make this decision between short castle and bishop takes the knight? Actually, because uh, so far we cannot figure out which option is better for white, we should rely on our chess instinct, on our chess intuition. And uh, as for me, short castle seems to be more natural rather than bishop takes on d4, in spite of the fact that bishop takes the knight is a forcing line, it's a capture. Why? Because uh, white secures his king, and white keeps his dark squared bishop. Maybe, uh, we don't know so far, maybe white uh, does not need to trade his dark squared bishop for the knight immediately, and can postpone doing so. And if short castle works, uh, it does not make sense to play bishop takes on d4 and to give black additional opportunities. So, let's start with short castle. In fact, before you play either short castle or bishop takes on d4 in your real game, you should do another important thing. You should be able to anticipate the potential responses of your opponent. Again, prophylactic thinking. You should flip a board in your mind and make a list of candidate moves for black. So, let's do it now. Let's flip a board. But, uh, first of all, let's highlight the main features of the position to be sure that we include all reasonable moves in our list and we are not missing something important. Okay, white played short castle. White secured his king. His king is now safe, while his black's counterpart got stuck in the center. White is leading in development. White has the advantage of two bishops. And the only potential issue for white in this position is an unstable position of his knight on c7. Therefore, besides considering forcing lines like knight takes on c2, queen takes on c2, or knight takes the bishop on e2, so besides considering all these forcing lines, 
we should also take into consideration moves aimed at the knight on c7. And among this move, these moves I would list queen c6, black can play this move either immediately or after first knight takes the bishop on e2 and then queen c6, king d7, again black can play it right now or after trading his knight for the bishop, and uh, last but not least I would include in the wrist knight f6 move. And it is not just a regular development move, in fact knight on f6 plays a very important role. It takes control over the d5 square and uh, if black is able to coordinate his pieces, for example if uh, he can play rook d8, king f8, he can just attack the knight in the future by playing the same queen c6 or rook d7. So there is no hurry with attacking this knight, maybe. We will see. Okay, it looks like we make the full list and let's start our calculation. I'm going to start with knight takes on c2 as uh, it's pretty easy to oppose this, this line. So after knight takes on c2, let's flip the board. Now we calculate the position for white. So again, we use the same method. We start with forcing lines and specifically with checks. So, and if you think about Possible checks in this position, you, re you can recognize that white has a powerful series of checks that starts with bishop c5. So black has only move king f6, queen d8, another check, king g6, and finally bishop d3. It's a pin, it's deadly pin, white wins the queen, and that's it, the game is over for black. So we can stop our calculation of knight takes on c2 and evaluate it as uh, forcefully winning for white. Okay, let's try queen takes on c2 now. It seems to be more logical. Black is defender and as you probably know it's favorable for defender to simplify the position in order to reduce the dynamic element. And uh, after black plays queen takes on c2, white cannot really avoid uh, queen's trading. Again, Considering white's, um, white's moves, uh, we start with forcing lines, checks do not work here, and uh, let's consider captures. As analysis shows, the best bet for white here is queen takes the queen, knight takes, and bishop a7. White attacks the rook, and the main idea behind this line is that after knight takes the rook, white first takes the knight, and next move, white will take the rook, and white keeps extra piece. Black cannot protect the rook, black cannot do, cannot do anything to restore the material balance in this position. White is winning. Okay, but uh, in, your, uh, in your game and in your calculation you can start with, other, with another capture, you can start with bishop takes the knight, now, uh, the best continuation for black queen takes the queen. If queen takes the knight, I think the simplest decision for white is just to play rook c1, attacking the queen. Queen cannot go on d6 in view of bishop c5, and again white wins the queen. Otherwise, white has a lot of resources, how to accumulate the pressure. He can play bishop c5, he can take the pawn on e5 if black leaves this pawn unprotected, and rook c5, and so on. So the position seems to be very dangerous for black. He, his king is very weak in the center. Black's pieces are undeveloped, so we don't need uh, to calculate this position until checkmate, so we just evaluate it as uh, very dangerous for black, and clearly better for white. Okay, so queen d1, let's calculate queen d1. So rook takes on d1, black takes the bishop, rook takes d4. Again, we can stop our calculation here and let's evaluate this position. So what I can see is that in spite of the material balance, white has more active pieces. Uh, a lot of black pieces are still on the initial positions, are still undeveloped. 
White is going to accumulate the pressure by bringing his rook on e file with different ideas of uh, discovered attack, bishop a6 and bishop c4 and so on. So for me it's obviously that uh, it's obvious that um, white has to be better in this end game. Probably black has to give up uh, the pawn in order to protect his king somehow. And again I just want to say that uh, if you start your calculation with bishop takes the knight on d4, if you was not, not able to find the idea with bishop a7 immediately, and you just see this end game, you evaluate this end game as favorable for white, don't look for best continuation. You will have the second chance later if your opponent really plays queen takes on c2 in the game, but so far one good line should be enough for you. Don't waste your time. You can uh, you can need this time in the future. Maybe your opponent will never play queen takes on c2 and you just wasted your time if you tried to find better continuations than bishop takes the knight on d4. Okay, so we are done with queen takes on c2. Let's try king d7 now. So black attacks the knight with the king. But uh, there is one visible drawback of this move. Black puts his king under the pin. And the first idea that comes to my mind is to play c3. White attacks the knight. Knight cannot legally go. So black has to take the knight on c7. But after c takes on d4, again, we can stop our calculation. We don't need to further calculate this position as uh, white's advantage is pretty obvious. White solves the problem with his knight on c7, white uh, keeps the advantage of two bishops, and white got additional c file at his disposal, the black king is still very unsafe, still in the center of the board, and uh, probably all these factors mean that the position should be winning for white. So we stop at this point and we evaluate this position as favorable for white. And the same with king d6 or king d8. We just skip. Just white still plays c3 and it leads to the same position. Okay. Now let's try queen c6. Queen c6. Black attacks the knight with the queen. But this move leaves the knight uh, on d4 unprotected. And uh, white can take on d4, e takes, and queen takes on d4. And it looks like after queen takes on c7, white can take the pawn on g7. And at first glance, the position seems to be absolutely winning for white, as black cannot really protect the rook on h8, and white uh, will have a decisive material advantage at first glance after queen takes the rook on h8. Okay. So let's try um, let's try knight takes on e2. It's forcing line, it's check, queen takes on e2, and again now black can attack attack the knight either by playing queen c6 or king d7. In the case of king d7, um, white cannot protect the knight, but he got at his disposal another important resource. Now he can play knight d5. And uh, if you are able to find the idea, if you are able to recognize that black cannot take the knight in view of rook d1, pin, and white wins the queen, you can quickly stop your calculation of king d7 line. So, um, let's try queen c6 instead of king d7, queen c6. So now white cannot play knight d5, but a noticeable drawback of this move, black just weakened his central e5 pawn. And the first idea that comes to my mind to attack this pawn by playing either bishop f4 or bishop g5. Okay, let's start with bishop g5, bishop g5 is check, black has to play f6, if he plays king d7, I can still play knight d5, or what's even better, I can play 
Rook D1 check, King takes, Queen E5. Next move, I take the Rook on B8 and White is winning. F6 and after F6, I can just take the pawn on E5. Black probably can still fight if he plays King F7. And uh, it looks like a fork, but I can play Queen F4. And black cannot legally take the bishop. Maybe it's not the best bet for white, but it's just uh, one opportunity. And besides, uh, I can take the pawn on a6 first in order to open the h 2 b diagonal for my queen. And after b takes, queen takes e5 and queen takes the rook. f takes the bishop and uh, again... I would evaluate this position as favorable for white, as black still has some problems with his king. His pieces are still undeveloped, and it looks like white has enough time to bring his forces to create some threats against the black king or to advance the pawns on the queen's side. So I would prefer to place this position for white, certainly. Okay, and uh, additionally... As analysis shows, uh, white has interesting option to play bishop b6. Again, it attacks the pawn on e5 and black cannot take the bishop in view of fork, knight d5. White wins the queen. Black still has to play f6. And um, now white, um, for example, can play queen e3 with the idea bishop c5 or rook d1 with the idea knight d5 and black still cannot take the bishop on b6 and even if white uh, did not win some material immediately the position still seems to be pretty dangerous for black his king is still unsafe and uh, again uh, i would prefer to play this position for white and uh, it's definitely better for white this position but again i would like to stress you don't need uh, to make a choice between bishop g5 bishop f4 or bishop b6 in your calculation if you see one option and you believe this this option is favorable for you just stop at this point and uh, you will have a chance uh, to make a new list of candidate moves and uh, to choose the best continuation later if your opponents really plays if, if your opponent really plays uh, this continuation this line okay so okay one left and uh, let's see what happens after knight takes on f6 our last candidate move so as I already said, black's intent to play rook d8, king f8, and if black stabilizes the position of his king, uh, white can be in danger. His knight on c7 can be in danger. So what sh white should play precisely, white should play vigorously in this position. So let's consider forcing lines. Knight d5 check, it does not work. Let's try capture. Bishop takes the knight. But it looks like after queen takes on d4, black uh, has to be fine either in an end game or in a middle game as uh, white cannot really play knight d5, cannot free his knight. And yeah, now I would prefer to play this position for black. Okay. So bishop takes on d4 does not work. Let's try bishop d3. Another tamping move, move with a threat, white attacks the queen, so queen has to go on c6, attacking the knight on c7. So, uh, rook e1, with the idea if black takes the knight, bishop takes the knight on d4, and again this exchange is favorable only for white, white uh, would be happy to trade his bet knight on c7 for the good knight on d4 so black uh, has to avoid it black can play king f8 so again it looks like 
white cannot go with his knight. If bishop takes the knight on d4, e takes on d4, and white cannot protect this knight. Probably the best practical chance for white is to try to open lines by playing f4. But after queen takes, f takes, queen takes on e5. Uh, I don't really uh, see how white can accumulate his pressure, how white can find resources to compensate his lack of material. So black uh, has pretty solid position, no real threats for white, and uh, yeah, I think black should be fine here. Okay, what else? We considered bishop d3, bishop takes on d4, another forcing line starts with c3. After c3, black, uh, is, black has to take the bishop on e2, otherwise, for example, if he plays knight c2, there is checkmate in one, bishop c5. If he plays knight e6, white is happy to trade again his bad knight for the knight on e6, and we can just stop at this point. If we see that trading is possible, white solve his main problem, and that's it. It means that white is clearly better. So knight takes on e2. Queen takes on e2. And again, black has the same moves that we should take into account. Queen c6 and king d7, or king d6, king d8. So let's start with queen c6. Queen c6, again, as before, uh, we can notice that this move weakens uh, the position of the pawn on e5, but if co we compare this position with uh, similar one that we discussed earlier, we can notice that uh, the position of the knight on f6 uh, is not really... Uh, is not really helpful for black in this position because black does not have an important defensive resource to play f6 as he could do earlier and for example if white plays bishop f4 black cannot play f6 he has to take the knight bishop takes the pawn on e5 the queen is hanging queen retreats and white takes the rook on b8 and white is winning the game is over for black so what's actually it's funny if we compare this position with the similar one that we discussed yearly when black uh, played knight takes on e2 let's see it so with this one remember so we discussed the position that arises after knight takes queen takes and queen c6 so it's very similar to the position that we discussed now, but the only difference is that black has his knight on f6, white has his pawn uh, on c3. And at first glance, uh, it looks uh, favorable for black. He did a useful development move. He developed his knight, and white just uh, moved his pawn from c2 to c3. But in fact, uh, as we could see, it just... Uh, makes the pawn on e5 weak and in fact including inclusion this moves is favorable for white okay let's go back so knight f6 c3 so queen c6 bishop f4 should be winning for white and let's see another principal continuation king Actually, king d8, king d8, let's see, king d8, it seems to be more natural than king d7, as it does not close the diagonal for the light squared bishop. So, king d8, again, the position is very concrete, white has to play precisely, white cannot play knight d5 in this position, because black can just take with the... Actually, white can play knight d5. Yes, white can play knight d5 in this position, and if queen takes on d5, rook d1, it's pin, and if knight takes on d5, there is a discovered attack, bishop g5 or bishop b6, and white wins the queen. So, uh, 
Probably the simplest decision after King D8 to play Knight D5. Okay, let's try King D7. It looks unnatural, but maybe it's better because in the case of Knight D5, Black can just play Knight takes on D5, and there is no discovered attack because the King occupies the light square. Okay, King D7. White cannot play Knight D5. White should be creative in this position. White cannot move his bishop because of pin. Queens move do not work effectively and uh, the only way for white to maintain the initiative is to sacrifice temporary the knight by playing f4. White plays f4. So king takes and f takes on e5. And uh, surprisingly f4 move contains very interesting tactical motif. The motif of the same discovered attack. So black cannot go with his knight. Black can play either knight d5, knight g4, knight d7 and so on in view of bishop b6. Again, white wins the queen. And additionally, black cannot just take the pawn on e5 because of bishop f4, pin. White wins the queen. Probably the most challenging continuation is bishop g4, counterattack. Black counterattacks the queen. But again, bishop b6 works perfectly for white. And if king takes on b6, rook takes the knight on f6 with a check. Otherwise, if king retreats, let's, let's say king d7, rook d1 check, king e8, queen f2, and uh, in spite of the fact that black has an extra piece, the rook on d1 is hanging, the pawn on f5 is hanging, the position seems to be winning for white. Black cannot take the pawn on e5 in view of pin rook e1. Black cannot really take the rook because e takes the knight and uh, white is threatening to play f takes on g7. Rook e1 is another powerful threat. And uh, honestly, I don't see how black can oppose a variety of white threats in this position. The position is very dangerous for black. His king is very unsafe and uh, material advantage does not compensate the weakness of the black king in this position. Okay. Also, let's see what happens if black plays king c8 instead of king d7. Now, white can trade the queens and after knight takes, play rook f7. And again, white has number of threats in this position. Rook c7 is one threat with uh, followed by different discovered attacks. Rook f4 is another threat. Double attack, attacking the knight on e4 and attacking the bishop on g4 simultaneously. So, Looks like this endgame has to be winning for white. Okay. Okay, it looks like we are done uh, with calculating all candidate moves after short castle. Okay, at this point a logical question arises. Is it enough to make a conclusion that uh, sh uh, short castle is the best continuation for white? Is it enough? Uh, to uh, to make a decision to play short castle in a real game well personally for me it's not enough and uh, i usually always uh, check my calculation so called second round of calculation and uh, in my opinion it is very important uh, to check your calculation in order to avoid blunders in order uh, to be sure that you was able to recognize all tactical patterns when you calculated variation in your mind. It's pretty difficult to calculate long variation in your mind and uh, it can be pretty easy to miss something. So for this reason, I always uh, go through all these lines uh, for the second time and uh, try uh, to anticipate more 
options for my opponents, try to anticipate all forcing lines, uh, try to consider all captures or checks and all moves with a threat one more time. Okay, let's do it now. So, we do it in the same order. We start with knight takes, sorry. We start with knight takes on c2. So, knight c2 is losing forcefully. So, we just calculate the same checks. Bishop c5, queen d8, bishop d3. So, no, no room for black uh, to change this line. So, knight c2 is definitely losing for black. Again, queen takes on c2. We know we have two options, queen takes and bishop a7, queen takes the queen and bishop a7, or bishop takes the knight and, and game. And again, both of them seems to be pretty um, forceful, and uh, it looks like black cannot add any value to these lines and enhance uh, his move somehow. Okay, let's try queen c6. Queen c6, bishop takes, queen takes. So maybe at this point black is not obligated to take the knight. We consider so far only queen takes the knight on c7. Maybe black can play knight f6. Let's try it. But uh, honestly, I don't think that it uh, changes the pictures for the black because uh, white has a pretty simple move and it's forcing line, it's check, queen e5 check. Black cannot go on the d-file because of rook d1. Black has to play probably king f8 or bishop e6. And in both cases, uh, the white knight on c7 will be safe. The queen on e5 helps to support this knight. And no, I don't think that we need to further calculate this position. Obviously, white has to be better here. Okay, let's see what happens after queen takes on c7 one more time. It's forcing line. Queen takes on g7. So, I don't see how black can keep his rook. Actually, black cannot keep his rook. But, at the same time, uh, my experience uh, hints me that uh, it's too early to stop here. Because uh, there is a pretty common tactical motif with sacrificing this corner rook and creating some threats using the unpleasant position of the queen at the corner of the board. So maybe we need to further calculate this line to be sure that uh, the white queen cannot be trapped at some point. So let's do it. Knight f6. So black has to play with the knight in order to open, uh, to open the line for his rook. Queen takes the rook and uh, suddenly uh, I realize that... Uh, Black has some interesting resources in this position. So one interesting resource is to play bishop g4. And uh, white actually has to give up his bishop. But in fact, after queen g7, in spite of the fact that black mm, temporarily restores the material balance, uh, the position is still very, very dangerous for black because of the and safe position of, of his king, still the same important factor. So white can just play rook e1, and the pin seems to be almost deadly for black. For example, after queen takes on c2, white can play queen g3, forcing line, tamping move, white attacks the rook on b8, and additionally, white can play queen e5, queen e3, queen e5, attack simultaneously the bishop on e2 and the knight on f6, so I don't see honestly how black can oppose all these white threats. So, it looks like white gets decisive material advantage after bishop g4. Okay, let's go back. Bishop g4 does not work. Let's try something else and... Uh, if you are looking for opportunities, you can be able to recognize another interesting idea for black. Bishop h3. And the idea behind this move is that white surprisingly cannot keep his queen in this position anymore. If he plays queen g7, 
Black plays rook g8 and queen cannot retreat on h6 in view of checkmate. Rook takes, king h1 and queen takes checkmate. So, it looks like white has to give up his queen. He can do it either immediately or after queen g7, rook g8, queen takes the rook on g8, but let's do it right now. Queen takes, queen takes, and g takes the bishop. Okay, it's pretty long line, so let's stop here and let's try to evaluate this position. Well, at first glance, white has um, pretty big material advantage. He has two rooks uh, and two extra pounds versus black's queen. Uh, usually, it has uh, usually it's enough to evaluate the position in white's favor. But on the other hand, uh, there are other important factors that we should take into consideration when we evaluate this position. In fact, one uh, in fact. Uh, we cannot say that white has absolutely healthy pawn structure. So white first of all has double pawns on the h file. And additionally, and I would say that it is the most important factor, after white played g takes on h3, he weakens the position of his king. And uh, this factor is really important because black uh, can bring his knight, for example, on f4, or on h4 and uh, try to create some threats against the white king. And for this reason, uh, for the reason of uh, potential weakness uh, of the white king, I cannot definitely say that this position is uh, so clearly better for white. Uh, if white is able uh, to coordinate his pieces, if white is able to bring uh, his bishop on the big diagonal and to restrict potential black's counterplay, probably yes, white will be better in this endgame. But uh, the position is very concrete and in a real game it cannot be not so um, it cannot be not so easy for white to oppose black's threats in this position. For example, let's see, uh, let's continue this line a little bit. For example, black can play queen e5 so queen e5, um, black attacks the pawn on b2, black, black does not really attack the bishop on e2 because of rook e1 pin, so white can play b3, and queen e5. So again, double attack, black attacks the pawn on h3, black attacks the pawn on c2, and another important idea behind this move, black prevents the transportation of the white bishop on the big diagonal, so white cannot play bishop f3, while black's plan is pretty obvious. He wants to play knight d5, knight a4, and uh, the pawn on h3 is hanging, so uh, without some further analysis, I cannot uh, say that this position is so safe for white. Intuitively, mm, I say that black has enough counterplay in this position. Okay. So, as you can see, thanks to our second round of calculation, we were able to recognize this additional tactical motif that we missed when we calculated uh, when we calculated Black's candidate moves for the first time. And now it's not so obvious for White whether is uh, short castle the best move for White or not. And uh, to decide it, we certainly need to calculate another candidate move. We need to calculate and figure out what happens if bishop takes the knight on d4. So, uh, let's take a break now. And when we are back, we will see what happens if bishop takes the knight on d4. We will calculate our second candidate move. Let's take a break now. Okay, we are back and now let's see what happens if white plays bishop takes the knight on d4, our second candidate move. So, bishop takes, black has a choice, as we already know, queen takes on g2 does not work well for black in view of bishop f3, and white has a decisive material advantage. So, let's try queen takes the bishop instead, it seems to be pretty natural, black tries to simplify the position, to trade off the queens, which is usually favorable for defender, 
Now the most principal continuation for white queen takes, e takes and long castle. White attacks the pawn and uh, the only question here is whether or not uh, black can create some threats against the knight on c7. So let's try to capture this knight. Black can do it by moving his king towards this knight and uh, for example, if he plays king d8, white can easily escape after he plays knight d5. So there is no more risk for the knight. White is going to play rook takes on d4 and just play this end game with extra pawn. White has to be winning. Okay. Instead of king d8, black can try king d6. It does not allow white to play knight d5. But instead, white has... Another powerful knight's move in this position, knight e8 check. And it is not just a check, it's double attack. Next move, white takes the pawn on g7. And uh, there is no risk for the knight on g7 at all. This knight uh, will escape through h5 square if black uh, tries to trap this knight. And so again, we can conclude that the end game has to be winning for white. So queen takes on d4. Is not good for black and it looks like black uh, has to play e takes on d4. Now, as before, before we make a decision, we have to make a list of candidate moves for white. So let's do it. As for me, I would certainly include in the list short castle. It's a pretty natural move. White finishes the development, white secures the king and wants to bring the rook on e5 as soon as possible. Additionally, I would take into consideration c4 move with the idea to support the knight on c7 because, as we know, this knight is very unstable and uh, if white is able to bring this knight back, uh, white definitely will have better chances due to unsafe position of the black king. And uh, what's more, I would also consider queen d2 move. It's a tempting move, the idea behind this move to play queen g5, attacking the pawn on g7. Additionally, white can use the queen on d2 to protect the knight by playing queen a5 at some point, queen b for check is possible in the future. And what's more, playing queen d2, white prepares long castle and uh, perhaps in these circumstances it makes sense for white to castle long uh, rather than short and to use the position of his rook on the d5. Okay, so let's start our calculation. And again, we need to decide what to consider first. We make uh, this choice based on our chess instinct. And as for me, I would start with short castle. Because it's just very appealing for me uh, to bring king into safety and start attacking in the center. However, before white plays short castle, uh, as usual, we have to anticipate the potential responses of our opponent. And if we are doing so, we will be able to realize that after black played e5 takes on d4, he got at his disposal very important e5 square. And now black can use this square to attack the white knight. So after short castle, black can play queen e5 and... As you can see, white cannot even take the pawn on d4, as he could do uh, when black played queen c6. So, knight cannot go, there are no squares for the knight, white cannot protect this knight, and so the only chance for white in this position to give up the knight and uh, to bring the pieces in the center as soon as possible and try to create some threats against the black king. So, let's try to do it. Rook e1, queen takes the knight, queen takes on d4, and now I think black can even play knight f6, ignoring all discovered attacks, because uh, if white plays either bishop a6 or bishop c4, black can always block check on the e-file by playing bishop e6. I don't think that there is any real danger for the black in this position. Or what? probably even better instead of king instead of knight f6 black can just play king f8 protecting the pawn with the king and uh, 
next black canizer play knight f6 or knight e7 and again i don't see any real compensation for the minor piece and obviously one pawn is not a good compensation here so i think black black should be fine okay short castle does not work we excluded from our list so let's do another candidate move let's do c4 so um, as i said playing c4 white wants to play knight d5 and uh, let's make a list of candidate moves for black taking into account white's intent first of all I would consider forcing lines for sure. Queen takes the pawn on g2, d takes on c3. These two moves are forcing lines. And additionally, I would uh, consider knight f6 move. Because as before, it takes control over the d5 square and uh, black just develops and he wants to play rook d8, king f8 and postpone playing against the knight on c7. Okay, let's start with queen takes on g2 now of course white does not want to retreat with his rook instead bishop f3 tempic move bishop attacks the queen queen g5 and now uh, if white takes the pawn on d4 immediately there is queen a5 check and the position is not so clear so uh, Again, as before, black can give up the rook on h8 and take the knight on c7. And I believe black will have some compensation in this position for sure. And mainly because the unsafe position of the white king. So, uh, to avoid this complication, it makes sense after queen g5 to play knight d5 first. King f8 and queen takes the pawn on d4. So. At this point, I think we can stop and uh, start evaluating the position. Well, as for me, uh, in spite of the fact that white was, was not able to castle uh, yet, uh, the position of his king is still safer than the position of his black's counterpart. And uh, even if white was not able to castle long, uh, he can put his king on d1. Or he can put his king on f1 after he plays h4 uh, to bring his rook on e1. And uh, I believe that white has more active pieces and will be able to create threats against the black king and use uh, his little development. So I would certainly evaluate this position in white's favor and I would stop my calculation at this point. Okay, let's try d takes on c3 instead. Again, we don't want uh, to retake this pawn automatically. Instead, we consider first of all forcing lines and uh, we can easily notice that after knight d5 check, king f8, knight takes on c3, black cannot take the pawn on g2 in view of queen d8, checkmate in one. So black has to take control over the d8 square. Queen is 7 for example, and after short castle, again, there is no need to further calculate this position. Obviously, white has better chances here due to his little development, due to his more active pieces, and the unsafe position of the black king. The same factors again. Okay. So, we considered queen takes on g2, d takes on c3, and now let's switch to knight f6. The most solid continuation in this position. And now, in order to play knight d5, white uh, will need to sacrifice the pawn. So, short castle, the most logical move, and queen e5. So, again, white cannot take the pawn on d4, white uh, cannot protect the knight, so he has to play knight d5. Knight takes, c takes, queen takes. Let's continue this line. Rook c1 seems to be pretty logical. Uh, preparing bishop c4 and also heading to c7 bishop e6 and uh, again as for me uh, we can stop at this position and uh, let's evaluate it so uh, 
In my opinion, white uh, definitely has some compensation for the pawn. So the black king is still in the center and uh, white uh, can put his rook on the 7th string by playing rook c7 or he can uh, create some pressure on the e-file after he plays bishop c4 and rook e1. Uh, however, I don't think that this compensation is enough for white to get any decisive advantage or create any real threats against the black king. Uh, in fact, the position of black uh, is not so dangerous and uh, he needs just few moves to stabilize his position, to bring his king into safety. He wants to play rook h8 goes on d8 or rook h8 goes on c8, then king f8 and so on. And uh, additionally, I think uh, the past d pawn can help black to create some counterplay in the center. So taking into account all these factors, I would say that this position has to be dynamically equal. So white has some compensation, but this compensation is not enough to get an advantage. This compensation can be enough to equalize the game and uh, to compensate some material disbalance. And for example, if white plays rook c7, king f8, queen d2, queen d6, and uh, even after rook c1, g6, queen h6, and king g8, uh, I don't uh, see uh, any real threats, I don't see uh, a lot of danger for black, so black can advance d pawn in the future to disrupt white species, and so I think black can hold this position. Okay, so let's go back. So we are done with c4 and now let's calculate queen d2 move, queen d2 move. So as I said, uh, the queen is heading to g5 or b4, a5. Again, before we make this move, we make a list of candidate moves for black and calculate them. So one of them for sure will be queen e5 attacking the knight, another one can be Queen takes on g2, and uh, I would also consider king's moves, king d8, king d7, king d6 attacking the knight. Okay, but let's start with queen takes on g2. Queen takes on g2, so the rook is under an attack. Long castle seems to be very logical, protecting the rook and securing the king. Now, if black does not play queen c6, white just grabs the pawn on d4, and uh, I don't think black will be able to survive. So queen c6 is the only chance. But now again, if we apply the same method, if we consider first of all forcing lines, checks, we will be able to find simple tactical decisions. So queen b4, first check. So e if black plays king d8, white can just grab the pawn with the rook and after king c7, rook c4 check. Otherwise, if uh, black plays queen d6, white can play knight d5 and uh, this just forces black to go with his king farther in the center and obviously uh, with such weak king, black cannot survive in this position. Okay, so queen g2 uh, seems to be favorable for white. Let's try queen e5. Queen e5. So, again, we do the same thing. We make a list of candidate moves for white, and first of all, we consider checks, captures, and moves with a trap. So one possible check is queen b4, queen g5 is bad check, we don't consider it, queen d4 bad capture, we don't consider it, and uh, additionally, if you keep looking for interesting resources in this position, you can be able to find an interesting 
move of queen f4. So, the idea behind this move is that if queen takes on f4, knight d5, then knight retakes the queen, and this endgame has to be better for white, because black has a permanent weakness on d4, and at some point white will probably win this pawn and just get better endgame. Okay, but we start with checks, so queen f4 is our candidate move, but we start our consideration with queen b4 check. So, again, uh, black has a choice, and now uh, the most logical continuation, probably king d7. If black plays queen d6, as before, white has a resource of knight d5, and if king e6, queen takes the pawn on d4, queen takes the knight, bishop c4, and the game is over for black. 